There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. It's interesting pause there, isn't it? Nicodemus, he comes by night. You know, so he's a religious leader. He's got all the robes on. He's got all the, the stuff. And, and Jesus, if Jesus has conflict with anyone, it's always with the religious people. But, but there's something that the religious leaders are starting to see in Jesus and his life and his witness and his testimony. And they're captivated by it. And for some reason, probably because Nicodemus just didn't want to be do it like public, make a public declaration that he was captivated by the teaching and message of Jesus. He goes by night, kind of covert, undercover. And verse 3, Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, it's like, it's like a dog when it hears a whistle, like, what? Be born again? How am I going to do that? How is that going to work? How am I going to be born again? I'm going to have a difficult conversation with my mom here. How am I going to be born again? Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So every one of us in here tonight, We've all been born of water. We've all been born of water. That is, that we've all been born from our mom's womb. But Jesus said, that's not enough. You've got to be born again, born a second time. And that is to be born of the Spirit. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I tell thee that you must be born again. The wind blows where it listens. And we hear a star there off, and they can't not tell where it comes or whether it goes, so even one that is born of the Spirit. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? He's like, I don't get it. And Jesus said to him, Art thou a master of Israel, and thou knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak what we know and testify what we see, yet you not, you, yet ye not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things, you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man has ascended on to heaven, but can come down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man shall be lifted up. For whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then that very famous verse, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Amen. May God bless to us that reading of his word. Let's just take a moment and pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. And we pray right now, Father, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us from your word, that you would teach us what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be born again. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just work in our hearts and in our minds, and that Jesus would be glorified in all that is said and in all that is done. Dear Jesus, speak to us and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What does it mean to be a Christian. That's a big conversation for lots of people. That's a big subject. I meet people often because I'm an evangelist and I meet people and I ask them this question, are you a Christian? And I get lots of people who say to me, yeah. And then I go, tell me about it. And they're not. They, they, were, they grew up in a church or they belong to a Catholic tradition or they belong to a Protestant tradition. They call themselves Christian, but they're not Christian. If you look at the statistics, it talks about like the United Kingdom being a Christian country. Well, it's not, is it? Not really. Anybody who's living in it, it's not, it's not really. 
So we can go to the map and we can go to all these kind of secular things. And it'll give us statistics about 60% of the United Kingdom is Christian. Well, you know and I know that's not true. Just because they, they were born into a, a church, born into a tradition, doesn't make them a Christian, right? You know that. So it's not enough just to be born into a, a, a Christian family. Being born into a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian. So there's lots of people... It's true that I, that I meet and I ask a question, you're a Christian, they say yes, and then the conversation plays out. The truth is they're not. They haven't been born again. They've been born once. They haven't been born twice. They've been born once into a tradition, but they haven't been born twice into a relationship. They haven't been born of the Spirit. There was a time that um, actually being a Christian had its benefits. Believe it or not, it's, it's certainly not like that today, but... For example, when I joined the fire brigade, it was good to put on my CV, uh, youth leader, uh, went to the boys' brigade. They were good things. So the guys you're interviewing, you go, I went to the boys' brigade. I'm going to get a tick for that. That's a good thing. No, you go for an interview. That means nothing. Nothing. In fact, it could go against you uh, because... That's not the society we live in anymore. We live in, some people call it a post-Christian society. It's post-modern, whatever fancy terms you want to use for it. But we have moved on. And so that's the challenges that we face today is, what does it mean to be a Christian? Because those definitions of a Christian, the secular terms for being a Christian, is not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And here's some of the things that we can learn from this tonight. To be a Christian is a new Person. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. You become a new person when you become a Christian. That's important that you know that. So if, you've, if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, you're not the old person forgiven. You're a new person. Sometimes we carry the, the old life through. You're not the old person forgiven. You're brand new. You've been made new. The slate has been wiped clean. The sins that are stacked up against us, the handwriting that's stacked up against us because all of us are guilty before God. There's no one in this room who hasn't told a lie. There's no one in this room who hasn't committed adultery. Right? What did Jesus say? If you look upon someone lustfully, then you commit adultery in your heart. There's no one in here who hasn't stolen something before. Mom said, just one biscuit, you took two. Right? So we're all in here just a bunch of lying, thieving adulterers, right? No? Well, we are by the old law, but not by the new one. Not by the new letter. We are in our old self. The handwriting is stacked up against us. We're guilty before God. But we stand tonight as a Christian you stand in the righteousness of Jesus because Jesus said, I'm going to take all our junk. I'm going to take all the sin, everything that Mitch has done. I'm going to take all the punishment that Mitch deserves, that you deserve, you deserve, you deserve, you deserve. And I'm going to absorb all of that in the cross. I'm going to become your substitute. I'm going to become your substitute so that you can go free, so that you can be free, so that you can be released. That's to be brand new. That's good news tonight. That's great news. You're not the old person forgiven. You're completely brand new. You're born again. I, I watched the news recently. I can't remember what it was. Um, no, in fact, I do remember what it was. It was that flag stuff on TV. And I was embarrassed. And I said to my wife, you know what? Thank God that I'm born twice. That I'm not like those people. Thank God that I'm not like those people who are right now standing on top of police landovers, throwing stones. I'm just amazingly bar- embarrassed like for humanity. So thank God that I'm actually not entirely part of that because I'm born twice. I'm brand new. I'm made brand new. And to be a Christian is to be a new person. We stand in the righteousness of Jesus. The slate is wiped clean. Be a Christian 
is to have a new way of thinking. We think different. First Peter 2, 2 says, Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that you may grow up in the salvation. We become hungry for new things. You have a new way of thinking. You see, before you become a Christian, you don't want to read your Bible. You don't want to go to youth fellowship. I remember people used to say to me, do you want to come to youth fellowship? I'm like, no. Really, like I can think of a hundred other things I would rather do than go to your youth fellowship. I would rather get my eyes plucked than go to your youth fellowship. I have no interest. I have no interest in praying unless something goes wrong. I have no interest in reading the Bible. I have no interest in going to your church. I don't have those desires. They're not there. But when you become a Christian, you've got new desires. You have a new way of thinking. You don't read the Bible anymore. Hey, peeps. You don't read the Bible anymore because you have to. You read it because you want to. And there is a difference. You see, as a Christian in here tonight, listen, you don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to pray. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to go to youth fellowship. You don't have to do those things. You don't have to feed the poor. You do it because you want to. You you get the difference? You do it because you've not a new way of thinking. One of the worst things we can do sometimes to our kids is, you have to read your Bible. Oh, I'm like, I teach my kids, you don't have to read your Bible. You should do it because you want to read it. Because you've got a relationship with Jesus and you want to learn more about Jesus and you've got new desires and God has put something brand new in you. You're different. You have a new way of thinking about things. You see things differently. When you're a Christian, it's a great little uh, cartoon, I'll throw this up. Um, Sometimes the Bible, we approach the Bible like this, I really need a translation that won't leave me feeling guilty, convicted, or in need of making some kind of decision. You know, sometimes we, we approach God's Word like, we just want the easy fix. You know, I want, I want an easy way of doing it. But that's when we've got a new way of thinking as a Christian, we should want to be challenged by God's Word. Now, somebody came recently and said to me, Mitch, this Christianity thing's not working. I said, what do you mean it's not working? I'm reading the Bible and I'm really challenged by it. I said, no, it is working. It's definitely working. That's what's supposed to happen. When you become a Christian, you've got a new power. Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Listen, before you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit was with you. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit isn't just for Pentecostal churches. The Holy Spirit is for all of us. He's the third person of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He's a person. He's got the characteristics of a person. And he was with you before you became a Christian. Because he's the one, the Bible says, who convicted you of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, God's on your case because the Holy Spirit is with you. He's challenging you. You hear a testimony. You hear the word preached. The Spirit of God is working in your life. Convicting you, challenging you. When you become a Christian, you ask Jesus to come into your heart, into your life, and the Spirit takes up residence in your life. And when the Spirit is living in you, you've got a new power. You've got a new presence inside you because the Spirit of God is living in you. The Spirit of God living in it, it, The Holy Spirit is not like for Pentecostals. It's for every believer. Every believer has the Spirit of God living in them. And then, of course, there are occasions after that where we sense the Holy Spirit really coming upon us and empowering us for service and equipping us for whatever that might be. It could be for preaching. It could be for teaching. It could be for administration. It could be for all kinds of things because every day we should be coming and asking the Holy Spirit to fill us afresh. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-off experience. We should have the power of God continually in our lives. Why do we need to ask for God's Spirit to fill us continually? Because we leak. When we do our own thing, when we go our own selfish way, we leak. And so every day, I come to God, I want you to come to God and say, fill me afresh, help me to be a better dad, help me to be a better husband, help me to be better at driving my car, help me to do life better. I ask the Holy Spirit to come and help me and empower me for service. 
It's not for special Christians. It's for every believer. Are you with me? Nod your heads. Pretend you're awake. All right, good. I know it's getting late. When you become a Christian, you become part of a new family. Have a look at the person on your left and your right. They are your brothers and sisters. It's great, isn't it? No. <laughs> like, oh. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. This blows my mind. Keep me one of those, would you? Uh, cinnamon lozenges, love them. This blows my mind that we become the children of God very quickly. The disciples come to Jesus and they are blown away by the way Jesus prays because they, he doesn't pray like Nicodemus. He prays completely different. Nicodemus and all the Pharisees, they all stand with their robes on. They've got all their colors. Well, they didn't wear colors, but they might as well have wore colors. They've got all the fancy things on and they pray in all fancy words and all fancy phrases and they, they use Hebrew and Greek and all these guys are all fishermen. They speak Aramaic, regular geezer language. And they're looking up at these big fancy people and going, big religious people going, wow, wish I could pray like that. But I'm never going to be able to pray like that because I don't know that stuff. I'm a fisherman. And they're all going, look at me. And Jesus comes along and Jesus prays in geezer language, Aramaic. And they're like, that's unbelievable. So they have a conversation, they send one of the disciples to him, and the disciple goes to Jesus and says, teach us how to pray. We want to pray like you pray. And this is what Jesus says. He completely rewrites the book of prayer when he says this. Just call him Dad. Abba, Father. Our Father. Because for these Jews... Because most of the disciples, if not all of them, were Jews. It's like the Lord is his name, greatly to be feared, thunders and lightnings. He's like the wrath of God. Any time that he's ever referred to in the Old Testament as a father, as like an authoritarian father, Jesus says, just call him Abba. The closest we have to that is Dada. It's true. Two syllables. I'm not being disrespectful of God. That Jesus is saying, like, just call him Dad. Dada. So my daughter, two years of age, nappy bottom, runny nose, da-da. Jesus said, we can approach him as the children of God. He's our dad. I don't know what your earthly dad's like, whether you've got a good one or a bad one, or you don't have one. But I want you to know this. If you're a Christian, you've got a good father in heaven. And you've got a great family called the church. And it doesn't matter whether that's Methodist or Pentecostal or Presbyterian or Free Presbyterian. That doesn't really matter. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is a relationship with Jesus. You get a new love, beloved. Let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of gain. Born of God and knows love. When you become a Christian and you become brand new, you have the capacity to love your enemies. You have the capacity to love things that before you had no interest in and to love people and to be connected with the family of God and connected with the kingdom of God in a deeper way than ever before. And here's the thing that really gets up my nose. Ask the world the first thing that comes into their mind when they hear Christianity. No one is saying love. They've done a survey in America because that's why they do all surveys, isn't it? What's the first thing that comes into your mind when you hear the word Christian? You know what the number one answer was? Anti-gay. Or anti-gay. Wherever you come from. Then it was like Narrow-minded, bigoted, terrorism. The list just got worse. And nowhere in the list did the, did the word love come anywhere near the top 30 or 40 answers. And that really annoys me because, you know what, as Christians in here, that's the thing that we should be known for more than anything else is love. Love our enemies. I don't see enough of that in the church. I don't see enough of that in our lives to love people. Love, love, love. Let's not be so narrow-minded and closed in and 
boxed in and say, I've got it all figured out and God works this way. Listen, God's bigger than your theology. Just get out there and practice some love, some indiscriminate acts of kindness. Help people. Love, love. Let that be the thing you're known as. Tertullian looked at the early church and he said this. This is like probably 160, 200. I can't remember what what the, the calendar year would be. But he looked on the church and this is what he said as an outsider. Look at how they love one another. That's a challenge for us because when you become a Christian, you get a whole new love. We just need to let that out. It's a great picture to define love, isn't it? Love is caring for each other even when you're angry. And you can picture a husband and wife there have had a bit of a rant. And, and he's, they've turned their back on one another, but the rains came on. And the umbrella comes out. He's just got the capacity just to love, to, to model it, even our enemies, even that moment where we fall out with someone. We still love them. We get new desires. It's a bit of a repeat of one of the, the points I made earlier, but it's important. Galatians 5, 16 and 7. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratif- gratify, gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. When you become a Christian, you get new desires. You want to do them, and the flesh is trying to oppose and push you away from that. It's not the other way around. It's not, if you're still living in the flesh, then it's difficult to do the things of the Spirit because you're living in the flesh. But when you're living in the Spirit, your flesh is always fighting, right? Relationships trying to pull you away. Alcohol is trying to pull you away. Whatever it might be, whatever the temptation is, gambling. It can be things that aren't sin, but they get in the way and they weigh you down. It can be sport. If sport gets in the way of your relationship with Jesus, get rid of the sport. I'm big in the sport, but I'm big, big into Jesus first. You get new desires. You have a new future. Last one. For God so, go back to our text, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The verse is 25 words long. The middle word is son. The first part of the verse is what God has done for you. The second part of the verse is what you need to do for him. For God so loved you. You see where it says the world in your Bible? Just put a little arrow above it and write, that means me. For God so loved you that he gave his son. Jesus chose to die for you and me, that he gave his one and only son. So so what do we need to do? Whosoever believes in him, the word believes there is the word pastuo, it's a Greek word, it means to put all your trust in. Because even the devil believes in Jesus, right? So it doesn't mean just I believe, it's like to put all your trust, all your hope. You know when you're a kid and you you made a swing and you you put the the branch in the, the rope and off you went, that's the idea here, you put all your trust You bank everything in on Jesus. Whosoever puts all their trust in Jesus will not perish, will not experience the second death, will not experience life in torment, but will experience eternal life with Jesus. That's good news. Amen. Pretend you're Pentecostal. Amen. That's the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is this. You become a new person with new desires, with a new family, with new love, with a new future. I'm all for that. Are you? Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? I'm not asking you, do you belong to a church? You see, the question I ask people is, are you a Christian? If they say no, the second question I ask them is this, why not? It's the easiest way to do evangelism. Sit beside somebody in the tree and just say, excuse me, are you a Christian? Uh, uh, I think so. You think so? Let's have a conversation about that. You either are or you aren't. Why not? The window cleaner came to our, our office a couple of years ago, and uh, I gave him his £4.50. It broke my heart. One window costs £4.50. So I gave him his £4.50, and I said, oh, you're Christian. He went, uh, I've thought about it. I said, you need to do more than think about it. There's a book. 
go and read that. And he came back two weeks later, wrapped the door, he became a Christian. That's four years ago, I think now. And he's going to Presbyterian Church. And he, he's doing great. He's doing great. Why? Because someone asked the question. I'm going to ask the question of you in closing tonight. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? A little over 2,000 years ago, he made his move. Now you make yours. I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer. For some of you, this could be the most important decision you ever make in your life. That is, this is not about the person to your left or your right. This is between you and God. Are you a Christian? Are you backslidden? If you're backslidden, I don't need to define that. You know exactly what that is. You're not walking as close with Jesus now as you were in the past. And you need to pray this prayer and slide back to Jesus. If you're not a Christian, you can pray this prayer tonight and you can be a Christian. Listen, you don't have to pretend to be a Christian. You can be a real one. Okay, you can wear the outfit, do all the stuff and not be a Christian. You can be a real one tonight. It's a prayer away. Here's the prayer I'm going to invite you to pray. And then afterwards, I'm going to give you this little booklet. The prayer, listen, this is the prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray it. And then after you pray it, I'm going to ask everyone with their heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or as a recommitment, to look up and give me a nod. Just look up and say, Mitch, I prayed the prayer. It's your first public profession that you're a Christian. Your first public profession that you've recommitted your life to Jesus. And, and as, that's as much as we're going to do. And afterwards, you come and see me and I give you a booklet and encourage you on the journey. Everybody okay with that? Hey, this is the prayer. There's nothing fancy about the words. It's the attitude of your heart. Dear Jesus, thank you for not giving up on me. I am truly sorry for the wrong things I have done. I turn away from everything I know to be wrong. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I invite you to come into my life, be my Lord, and be my Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, like a little child. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your spirit and give me a home in your kingdom. That's the prayer. You ready? Let's bow our heads. Please respect the person to your left and your right. Let's not look around. This is... This is an important moment for people. If we bow their head in the quietness of your own heart, if you're backslidden, if you're not a Christian, pray this prayer with me tonight. Dear Jesus, thank you for not giving up on me. I am truly sorry for the wrong things that I have done, and I turn away from everything I know to be wrong. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and taking the punishment that I deserve. Like a little child, I pray, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to serve you and give me a home in your kingdom where I can praise you forevermore. Thank you for your love. While every head is bowed and eye is closed. If you prayed that prayer tonight for the first time or as a recommitment, right where you are, I want you to look up and just give me a nod. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I've got a countdown from five. Anyone else? Four. Three. Two. Father God, we want to thank you for those people who have responded tonight. We thank you that your word is truth, that your word does not return void. And Lord, as we leave this place tonight, we are careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.